We are switching lanes now to track and field. The Sportsmax Zone has welcomed many champions over the years, and today we have uh, another among our ranks. This woman has captured World Championship gold on two occasions, eight years apart, first in 2015 and then 2023. Guessed it yet? But it's the reigning 100 meter hurdles world champion, Danielle Williams, and she had a chat with Ricardo and uh, Mariah earlier today. All right, so Danielle Williams, it's a pleasure to have you on our set today. And, you know, I just want to start instantly by, of course, thanking you, Juan, for making the time to join us and to ask you about, you know, how was last season for you? I think it's um, important that we reflect on mm -hmm. what last season was because it was a really good season for you. Well, thank you for having me. Um, last season, to sum it up, I would say tumultuous. There was a lot of ups and downs, but I think it ended on a very strong note. And so I look to that for inspiration for this year. Yeah, and speaking about a very strong uh, season last year, mm -hmm. talk to us a bit more. Um, so it started off the indoor season. We wanted to run a couple indoor races. That's January through March. And then I got injured. I injured my foot. So we really had to, to back off a bit of that. And then so we turned our focus to the outdoor season. And it start, the outdoor season started very strong. I started with what was my, I think, my third fastest opener in April and then it kind of went downhill from there. I started running very slow times and really, we really had to stop and look and, and assess what we were doing in training at that time to say, hey, what we're doing right now is obviously not working because we're not seeing the results. And so we, we shifted focus for a bit and then we started getting the results that we were looking for. And um, so yeah, the focus for last year's uh, was always the, the World Championship. Um, and doing our best performance at our best at that moment, at that meet. And we used the necessary meets, the Diamond League meets, the Continental Tour meets, uh, to get us in shape for that championship. How are you able to stay focused when things are not going your way? My support system, for one. Um, I have a very close-knit support system that keeps me grounded. They, they believe in me, they push me, they pick me up when I fall. And I believe in God, first and foremost. And I believe that he will place me where I need to be. And the things that I go through are really just stepping stones to get me to where I need to be. And if I stay grounded, it will work out for me. Yeah, and you have been through a lot, but you have consistently found a way to get through them and come out on the better end. And we've, we've, we've seen that so often in your career. 2024 will start with the World Indoor Championships being the first major event. Is mm -hmm. that something that's on the cards for you? It is not on the cards this year, no. Mm. I'm my singular focus, <laughs> yes. <laughs> my singular focus this year will be the Olympic Games. Mm. And that's because you've never been to an Olympic Games, is it? Yes, perhaps that is the only reason. <laughs> <laughs> um, how do you approach this year, given the significance of it for you clearly, mm -hmm because you're a two-time world champion, and when you're a two-time world champion, you go, well, yeah, definitely, that person has also been to the Olympic Games. Yes. But you haven't. How, how does a year like that greet Danielle Williams? I try not to make it bigger than it is. I, I really treat it as another championship, just so that I don't get too lost in the moment. But definitely, I, I have taken a much different approach than I have previous years, previous championships, I'm, I sat back and I analyzed everything that I did last year and I was like, what can I do differently to make sure that this year goes smooth, as smooth as possible. And so I've, I've taken stock of my training, my recovery, my nutrition, my hydration, every facet of my preparation. I'm ensuring that is in the right hands and it's going forward so that I'm in the best possible position come June in the, for the national championships to be on that team. Yeah, and we definitely look forward to that. Um, I've always been interested because you're pretty fast, right? Yeah. 725 for 60, <laughs> yeah. um, 11.2 for the 100. Surprisingly, and a lot of people may not even realize this, 22.6 mm -hmm. for 200. Was there ever a part of your career, and I remember as well you winning a 100 class two title at Champs. Yes. <laughs> Was there ever a part of your career where you went, hmm, maybe I'll think about the flat sprints? No. No? <laughs> no. Why not? 
Um, I actually think the 200 is, is my stronger event, to be honest. I just don't want to do the 400 and the, the background for that. <laughs> but as far as the 100, I have never considered myself to be a strong sprinter. Mm -hmm. And part of it is probably is because I, we haven't worked on it yeah. at, at all. So the phases that I need to do, I have not been good at it. I mean, even I ran a 60 meter last weekend and I ran two rounds, the prelims and the finals. The prelims, coach said, hey, you're first, you, you got up as if you were running for towards the hurdles. Let's fix that for the finals. And then I tried to fix it for the finals and I stumbled. So it's, it's <laughs> never anything that I could get consistently. Yeah. And so I've never thought that, hey, let me go and, and run the flat sprints. So yeah. you're just sticking to what you know. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, and it has worked out pretty well for you. Um, the relationship with your sister, Shermaine, mm -hmm. um, you've both been in a world championship final together, 2015, when you won your first world title. So clearly that is memorable for you. Yes. Um, personally, I remember Charmaine on the scene before you were on the scene, and I thought to myself, this girl is going to be something special, um, especially after she won the World Youth Silver Medal. And then you came along, mm -hmm. and people went, oh, they are sisters, and this <laughs> one is even better. How has the relationship changed and matured over the years, if any at all, mm -hmm. especially because she doesn't compete as much anymore? Um, Charmaine was like the catalyst for me being an athlete. I mean, I saw her growing up and she was making teams and she was winning medals and she was really the driving force behind my success as a, as a young athlete coming up. and. We got a chance to go attend college together and we were training together and we were really real competitors. Um, she pushed me and I pushed her and you know, she's always happy for me. Uh, she didn't get to the heights that I got to, but I'd like to think that you know, she enjoyed her career and she got the best that she could get out of it. And you know, she's always there wishing me best of luck and congratulations and all that. So it's, it's definitely good to have her and my other siblings in my corner. Yeah, is it the type of relationship where she gives you a lot of um, competition advice, a lot of training advice, technical advice? No, <laughs> Jeremy is a, a woman of few words, so no, <laughs> yeah, not at all. That I remember very much. Um, here's a discussion for you. I think personally mm -hmm. that Daniel Williams is now the greatest Jamaican sprint hurdler ever based on everything that you've achieved. And, and that is massive when you think about the hurdlers wow. that Jamaica has produced from Michelle Freeman to Delorine and Bridget yeah. Foster Hilton to the current crop, which is really, really good. And given your two world titles, I think you are the pick of that bunch. How do you see yourselves, yourself um, in the history of Jamaican sprint hurdling? You know, I've, I've never really thought about it, to be honest. I mean, I've heard people mention that before, but that's not something that I think about. I mean, I, I don't really know the accolades of the other hurdlers. I mean, I knew Bridget, Bridget I think Bridget has all three colors from the World Championship, and, yes. and nobody except Megan has an Olympic medal. There you go. So I really, <laughs> the others, I really don't know per se. I mean, I'd have to look at their body of work versus my body of work, but um, if that is, really true, then it is an honor to be considered to be the greatest Jamaican hurdler. And I know we have a rich history, so that's definitely an honor for me to even be in that conversation. Yeah, how's a day in training for you? I know you're very busy. It depends on the day. <laughs> every, day every day is not the same. For like Monday is the busiest day because we were coming off of a day's rest, as coach would like to say. So we don't practice on Sunday, so we're coming off a day is rest, so Monday is the busiest day. Monday is our heavy running day. Monday is when we do a lot of running. Right now we're in our background pre-season, so we're doing a lot of over-distance stuff. And so that day is the heaviest day because we have a lot of running in our legs, and then I have leg day at, at the gym, and, so, and then I have treatment and all that. So really a full day for me is training starts at 9.30, and I don't get home until four four thirty on Mondays. So it's it's really a full day. And we have days where it's just hurdles. And we have days where it's just plyometrics and core days, but every day is a different day. Yeah. Lennox Graham, mm -hmm. your coach, and you've had a wonderful working relationship over the years. I'm interested though, did you go to Lennox because he had your sister? How how did that happen? 
I tell him all the time that I, he really didn't give me a choice. I, he didn't recruit me to go to his school. I, I remember that I think it was uh, probably a Jamaican international invitational meet. Yes. Yes. <laughs> uh, the, uh, way back then, and I saw him in the stands, and he came with Charmaine at the time and, and Leeford, and he was like, you're going to come to my school. And I was like, OK. <laughs> Easy. And that was just how it worked out. And when it was time for me to graduate from high school and matriculate into college, it was like, you're coming to my school. And I was like, I'm coming to your school. And so I just naturally, and he had my sister, and he had coached her when she went to Alpha as well. And so I had known him for a very long time as a young girl. And so it just felt natural. And by the time you had finished Johnson C. Smith, mm -hmm. you felt comfortable and confident enough that he was the man to take your career forward, your professional career. Yeah, because I mean, I went into Johnson C. Smith as a little girl who I didn't really do much at the Queen's School when I was um, an athlete there. I mean, I remember one of the first practice sessions when we went to Johnson C. Smith. And at the end of the warm up, I'm like, is, is that the end of practice? <laughs> Practice at, practice at Queens lasted for about an hour, an hour and a half max, and here I am, and the warm-up is one hour, and we're just, it was like, okay, it's time to the workouts now. So I was like, okay. So I came to realize that I wasn't really doing much mm -hmm. as an athlete at Queens, and that the success that I had found there, it was just really just natural talent at that point. And then, so he took me from that point, and he took me all the way to... 12.69 and a world championship berth in 2013. And I was like, clearly you know what you're doing, so why would I go anywhere? Yeah. Did you leave high school early? I did. I did not go to class one, yes. Why? Because I, f I finished school. <laughs> <laughs> I went to sixth form. I did both years at sixth form, and I just finished school, so it's time to move on. Okay, so leaving on time, but leaving the high school track and field scene early. Yes. Um, Here's possibly a tough one, right? Mm -hmm. 2019 mm -hmm. was a tough incident at the national championships. Um, I can only imagine how tough it was for you as an athlete to, to be involved with it. Right. As a commentator, it was tough for me. Mm -hmm. um, and I could feel inside the national stadium that it was tough for the fans there as well um, to see you disqualified in that way. Um, and the emotions that followed four years on um, yes. how do you reflect on that incident do you feel any differently about it to be quite honest it's something that i kind of put to the back of my mind i really try not to think about it i really try not to talk about it i mean every now and then we're at where i train it and it comes up when we're talking about things but i try not to, to think about it i try to move on from negative things and focus on the positive but for me it was really a negative experience one that i wish that no athletes would ever have to experience for themselves and so um I tried to move from it, move on, and not dwell on it, and, and learn from what happened in that moment, and try never to, to put myself in that position ever again. Mm -hmm. And that's just my take on, on that incident. Yeah. Yeah. Quickly, do you feel you got enough support back then? Uh, from the people who, who mattered to me, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, I, re I don't really pay attention to what's happening outside of that, and so I really don't know what was going on outside of the people who are important to me, and, and they had my back a hundred percent and that was all that counted for me you know listening to you i could tell that you know you're very very certain about what you're doing yes. it's as if nothing really affects you if it doesn't matter because i'm listening to your answers when ricardo is asking mm -hmm. how are you able to just be so sure about what you want to do and not get you know like get accustomed or you know become easy um, I've always been pretty determined. Um, I've set a standard for my life that I want to achieve. I set goals that I want to achieve, and I, I try not to let anything throw me off that path. Um, at the end of the day, this is my job, and this is the thing that I've chosen to do, and so I have to stay focused on what is the bigger picture. And yeah, that's really it for me. I mean, I, if I allow all the outside noises and the negativity to get in, then I am going to be a sinking, a sunken ship. 
And so I try to stay afloat. Um, I have to stay afloat in order to achieve anything in this sport. You can't really let anything get to you because you have to be hyper-focused on what it is. I mean, you really have one opportunity to get it done. And if you let the outside influences come in, then you're, you're not going to achieve what you're yeah. wanting to achieve. Mm. Track and field is a pretty difficult sport. Mm -hmm. um, you outlined earlier what a training day could look like and how difficult that is generally. For you, um, because as a professional, and it doesn't matter what you do, sometimes it becomes a lot and you need a breather. Mm -hmm. um, how does Daniel Williams get a breather? I don't know, my friends, um, we like to have our, our game nights where we just relax and... Like every Friday? <laughs> no, not anymore. <laughs> we used to, but not anymore. Um, you know, we hang out, we go out, we shoot the breeze, I watch TV, uh, I play games on my phone or on my TV. And do you party? I do not, no. Mm. Are you a series watcher or a movie watcher? A series watcher, yeah. Which one are you watching now? Well, I just started a typical. Um, while I was on the plane Sounds like here. something Mariah would watch. <laughs> I <laughs> literally just watched episode one while I was on the flight last night. But um, I'm more of like a master chef uh, girl or Hell's Kitchen. I watch Wheel of Fortune and Jeopardy every night. So, oh. Do you cook a lot? I do, yes. Yeah? yeah? yeah. What's your favorite meal? What could you chef up for us in a short time? In a short time? Probably some pasta, chicken pasta or something. <laughs> I hope it's better than the one I had with Mariah the other night. <laughs> yeah, we it had will, some really bad pasta. For sure, for sure, it would be. <laughs> yeah. Um, so here we are in 2024. By the way, you are in Jamaica for the RJR Sports Foundation um, Sportsman and Sportswoman of the Year Awards. Mm -hmm. um, I want to get from you just how happy you are to be nominated again for that award and for the People's Choice Award as well. Oh man, it's to hear that I was nominated for the Sports Woman of the Award. Actually, it took me by surprise. I was like, wow. Really? Yeah. You won the world title. <laughs> yeah, but I wasn't <laughs> thinking along those lines, to be honest. And so when I heard, I was like, wow, I got nominated. And so to know that we have such a rich, especially female sports history. Yeah. And to be counted among, I think this is, my, this is my second nomination, so to be counted among the worthy to be nominated, I mean, we, women have been excelling in sports recently. And so to be nominated, is, it's an extreme honor. And then I saw that um, I was nominated for the People's Choice, Choice Award. Award as well. Yeah. And so that's definitely something to look forward to. Um, I see the competitors that I'm up against. And as a competitor, you want to win, but yeah. I, I see their bodies of work. and. I honestly believe they're as deserving as I am, so it could go either way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and based on what we've learned, um, Mariah, when it comes to the Sportsman and Sportswoman of the Year award, you, or awards, you have um, specific criteria that is used to determine the winner. But when it comes to the People's Choice Award, it's all about how I feel about the performance. And Daniel Williams is my People's Choice winner uh -huh. for 2023. There Thank is you. no gold medal that felt sweeter than a lane one victory. Or was it lane two on lane the two. nine lane track? Lane yeah, lane two on the nine lane track. Um, for me, the upset of the 2023 World Championships in Budapest. So I hope you win that later on. Thank you. Um, the best. And if you don't, don't you can consider yourself upset, you know? having a, a sports match. Say that again. I don't know why everybody seems to think it's an upset. You I, didn't see it as an upset. I didn't see it as an upset. When I am um, go, going into the World Championships, uh, before I had a conversation with a coach and he was like, do we think we can win? And he said, yes, we can, but it's going to be tough. And that was like four a month out. Training session started, we went into the camp, we were training very well, I was doing some starts with Orlando at the time, and <laughs> we were very competitive, and I started getting more and more confident. Mm -hmm. I went into the, the first round, and I went into the first round to run 12.5, I mm -hmm. thought. 12.5 was good, good enough, it's usually a good enough time, it's gonna be competitive, yeah. fortunately. My competitor was on a different time, which is <laughs> <was> fine. <laughs> so I was like, okay. Cool. I still know where I am. Everybody else ran 12.5. We are where we need to be. I went into the semifinals, and I ran the semifinals, and the position, I finished third in the semifinals as the fastest loser. But I know the exact mistake that I made in that race. Mm. 
because I was win I was leading and yeah. I knew the exact mistake I made and I went around to the finals uh, to the warm up track and I told coach we have it don't worry and so <laughs> I went into the finals knowing that I could win if I ran my race that I needed to run yeah. and that's what I did you know what the amazing thing is every race I saw you run in 2023 in the build up to mm -hmm. the world championship final looked very similar you led to 60 to 70 mm -hmm. and then you were third fourth whatever the case might be but in that final mm -hmm. something was different can you quickly tell us what that something was well it was the finals <laughs> <laughs> everything was on the line um i knew that my start had been pretty consistent over the year over the, the, the course of the year i knew where i was making the mistake and it wasn't a mistake that i could correct overnight mm. but i knew that if i was just able to just fix it fix it in that moment and it still wasn't fixed but it was slightly better than it was mm -hmm. they'd have to catch me because i was already going to be so far gone and so i knew if i could just stay ahead of myself just a little bit in that moment then they would the, the only place they could catch me was at the finish line yeah and so it just so happened that they were closing, but they weren't closing fast enough. And so it worked out in my favor. Yeah, yeah. and sometimes the pressure of the moment, the you just moment. can't get back. Yes. And no one got back to Daniel Williams in Budapest 2023, like they didn't in Beijing 2015. Daniel Williams, thanks very much for chatting with us. Thank you for having me. Yeah, an excellent chat there with uh, Daniel Williams and very, very significant towards the back end of that interview, Ricardo, that she didn't consider her win an upset. Um, most experts considered it an upset. Most media considered it an upset. And I think partly because is there a more competitive event in world track and field than the women's 100 meter hurdles? I, I think not. N no. I think not as well. Yeah. And I think it has been that way for a long time yeah. where when you get into these major finals, you have eight women who all believe if they get it right, they can yeah. win the gold medal. Yeah. And I think that's what we got from Daniel Williams there because even though she hadn't won a major race for the entire season leading into that final, yeah. she still felt if she put it together, she could have won the gold medal and she did. Yeah, and you know what? They're like, I think like, eight women faster than she was in 2023 on, mm -hmm. on, on the top list. And when you look at um, Kamasha Quinn, Kendra Harrison, Nia Ali, um, Tia Jones, Amosan, the yeah. world record holder, you, you, when these girls line up, you have no clue as to who is going to win. Yeah. Not dissimilar to 2015 when she won as well, Lance. When she won in 2015, Daniel Williams, it came out of nowhere. Nobody expected her to win that world title. I'm not even sure if many expected her to be in the world championship final or to win a medal. But I think as well, sometimes in the women's 100 hurdles, the athlete who comes through is the one who does not have the pressure of the moment. Um, and I've seen that time and time again. I remember with Dawn Harper in 2008 yeah. when a lot of the focus was on Lola Jones and the Jamaican athletes as well. Um, and, and so many other races where you see the underdogs coming through in the women's 100 hurdles or the athlete who has garnered the experience over time and understands how to handle the pressure of that yeah, moment. I think that's a very, very good point. And um, it was what brought her through because I, when I look back at that race, at 80 metres, Kendra Harrison, to me, looked as if she was just about to, to edge ahead yeah. of, of Daniel Williams. And she had, 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 had none of that. And there is one athlete you just mentioned, Lance, who hasn't necessarily handled the pressure of the biggest moments. Well, Kendra Harrison. Yeah. Um, but maybe her time is still to come. Yeah. Bridget Foster Hilton, the Jamaican, for many years um, finished second and third and then finally won her world title in 2009. In Berlin. Um, in Berlin. Yeah. And again, she wasn't the favorite. Yeah. in 2009 yeah. point, when point, she won. Point well taken. Maybe the, the athletes in those moments that feel less pressured and uh, less on their shoulders to bear uh, maybe have the up, upper hand. So Daniel Williams, really great interview there and I um, uh, hope she wins a, a good award tonight at the RJR Glena Sports Foundation Awards. We and will. I hope she makes it to the Olympics this year, Lance. I really do hope she makes it to <laughs> Paris. <laughs> I think she will. I think she will. We go to break. Back with more on the Sportsman Zone after this. <laughs> 